the title of the 8th chapter? Attaining the Supreme. So, if we think about our life's mission, since we are a little child, through whatever age we may have come, we have had this goal, to achieve the best, to attain the Supreme. That has been our ultimate goal. Okay? And I can ask one question. If we look back at when we are a child, to maybe youth, to early adulthood, adulthood, and maybe as far as we progress, how many different definitions of supreme have we come up with? If you ask a small child, what is supreme? Living in a house where there's unlimited chocolate and ice cream. <laughs> that is supreme. What could be better, huh? But in the eyes of that young child, that is very legitimate. There's intense faith. That is 
the Supreme. And then maybe as you grew up, you thought, being Supreme is, oh, living in a house with her, no rules. No one telling me what to do. That rebellious nature starts. And then as we grow up, we define, oh, maybe living this uh, supreme is going into some beautiful city that seems very fanciful to us. Maybe to a new country. Maybe just to a new apartment. And in this way, we define so many different definitions of supreme. But the one question we have, have any of those given us the peace and happiness we want? If we lived in a house full of chocolates and ice cream, would we be happy? No. But we think, eh, that might be it. So Krishna, in this chapter, is giving us the clear path to the absolute supreme destination. And it's not Hawaii. It's not the North Pole, South Pole. What is the supreme destination that Krishna is giving us the road map, the GPS directions to? Goloka hmm? Vrindavan. Goloka to the supreme abode. So we know when we begin any journey, we have to put in, where is my destination? So in our spiritual life, we should establish firmly within our heart the goal of our spiritual life. Because when we have a goal in mind, then our effort will be more Serious. Just like if I go to the gym with a goal in mind to make a fit body, then I will use my time in the gym wisely. I'll find how to optimize the different activities. I will be very thoughtful about how to maximize that. Because I have a goal in mind. But if I just go to the gym to kill time, how? what result will come? Maybe something but not soldiers, right? So it's very important, and Krishna is guiding us here, to understand the goal. And the goal is to attain the Supreme. It is the same goal we've had our whole life. So the goal has not changed. All Krishna is now pulling us into, what is really Supreme? What is the ultimate that one can achieve? Everyone has the same goal. Anybody is not looking for the Supreme? No, we all are looking for it. It's just a question of where to find it. So, in the fifth and sixth verses, we'll do some review because it's been some time. The fifth and sixth verses, Krishna gave the formula that determines where we will go and how to attain the supreme destination. And what is that formula? Remembering Krishna at the time of death. What happens when we remember Krishna at the time of death? Huh? We go back to God. For sure? Positively? So if we read the fifth verse, Krishna says, Of this, there is no doubt. So, the key to going back to the Supreme is simply to remember Krishna at the time of death. Right? So then, what are we doing here now? Death is some long way away. But what is the, the difficulty in this formula? Huh? 
how to remember Krishna at the time of death. So Krishna told us in the seventh verse what to do. He said, therefore Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. So what is Krishna in essence telling us? When should we begin to remember Krishna? All the time. All of them. Now. Why now? We never know when the death is. We never know when that time is coming. Anybody knows? Very rare few souls have had the fortune to know. Like Parikshit Maharaj. Katvanga Maharaj. And few others had the great fortune to know. Why? Because when they know when it's coming, the wise will do what? They'll prepare themselves. So Krishna is guiding us that we should begin to remember Krishna now. So that whenever it comes, today, tomorrow, or a hundred years from now, no problem, I am ready. <clears throat> but remembering Krishna does not only give us the keys back home to Godhead. The process of remembering Krishna itself gives us the bliss and happiness that awaits us in the spiritual world. That's the... Just like when you go to the office, you have to endure some labor to obtain some result, the monies that you'll then use to try to enjoy. Right? So you endure some effort to obtain some fruit, some result. But in Krishna consciousness, the process is the same as the end result. Meaning the process of remembering Krishna by thinking about His names, forms, pastimes and qualities, that in and of itself is very sweet. The same sweetness one experiences in the spiritual world, in the supreme destination. Do we have the same sweetness on Saturday and Sunday as we do Monday through Friday? <laughs> we have the same sweetness? No. But in Krishna's formula, the process of purifying, the process of obtaining the supreme, has the same sweetness as having attained. That is the magical formula. How merciful the Lord is. He is not saying, oh, you, you endure difficulties of remembering me. Then you will get the fruit. No, the process along the way is also sweet. So Monday through Friday is the same as Saturday and Sunday. In the process of bhakti. But we have to be careful. Because what happens if we don't remember Krishna at the time of death? Birth again. And where? Who, who, whose pastime did we discuss? Anyone remembers? The Jadavarat. Great devotee took birth as a deer because of a momentary lapse in remembering Krishna. So next time we wonder What's the harm of watching just one movie? What's the harm of just doing just one, one day I'll not think of Krishna? When you want to answer that question, what's the harm? You read the pastime of Bharat Maharaj. And you'll see. So Krishna gave this in the first several verses. He explains how to meditate. And then, he now begins to speak about how we can have some faith in establishing this is the goal to attain Goloka Vrindavan. Okay. So, how do we 
establish instead of a house full of chocolates and ice cream, we make the goal attaining the spiritual world. So he explains very interestingly that this world that we live in, he says it is Dukalayam and Ashashvatam. What is Dukalayam and what is Ashashvatam? Hmm? Misery. Misery means Dukalaya. And what does Ashashvatam mean? Temper. So, is there anywhere in this world where we do not find Dukkha? Hmm? Krishna says, from the highest planet to the lowest they're all full of misery. The life mission of most is to try to find that one corner of the world where there is no misery. Krishna is saying it doesn't exist. And the main reason why? Because everything is temporary. We are eternal soul. We want eternal happiness, eternal bliss. So as soon as we enter a temporary existence, we become frustrated. If you give a child a toy temporarily, do they find great happiness and bliss? We as adults, we acquire so many toys, so many facilities. But why we're not able to enjoy them? Because they're all temporary. So then Krishna spoke about his spiritual world. To compare, as opposed to Dukalayam and Ashashvatam, what is the nature of the spiritual world in the 21st verse, 20th and 21st verse? He says, Yet there is an another unmanifest nature, which is eternal and transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested nature. It is supreme and is never annihilated. When all in this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. The 21st verse. That which the Vedantas described as unmanifest and infallible, that which is known as a supreme destination, that place from which, having attained it, one never returns, that is my supreme abode. What is the characteristic of Krishna's supreme abode? What are some of the characteristics? One never returns. Why would this one never return once having achieved the spiritual world? If you've experienced the bliss of the spiritual world, why would anyone want to come back to the place that is full of dukkha? Right? Having experienced the difficulty of the prison house, once a prisoner has left, no one ever desires to go back inside. So similarly, Krishna says, once one experiences again my spiritual world, one never returns. What are some other characteristics of Krishna's eternal abode? Infallible. Infallible. What does infallible mean? No errors. No errors. So think, what kind of things exist in an infallible world? How many of us would like to be making no mistakes? <laughs> Hmm. 
Imagine a world where the weather is always perfect. Take one simple, small feature, the weather being perfect. Now how attractive it would be? That's infallible. Imagine a world in which there is no conflict. There is no conflict between anyone. Would that be nice? You are free to go anywhere without any fear. How peaceful and loving that would be. Where everyone loves and respects everyone as friend. That's an infallible world. Imagine all the foodstuffs are always cooked perfectly. Never too much oil, too little. Never too much spice, never too little. Never, oh, I forgot salt. That's infallible. These are just small aspects of infallible, but how attractive it would be. Imagine you've built your home. There's no maintenance. Nothing. No, why, why no maintenance in the spiritual world? Huh? Everything is eternal. No insurance. Why no insurance? <laughs> Nothing happens. There's no calamity. No accidents. That's infallible. Who has no job in the spiritual world? Doctors. Why no doctors in the spiritual world? Because the body is Satchitananda. It's eternal. That's the spiritual world. No bills to pay. Why no bills to pay? Everything is unlimited. Supply and demand, those of you who study economics. The price of any good is based on supply and demand. The higher the demand and the lower the supply, what happens to price? Now if supply is infinite, then what is the price? Regardless of demand. This is just a glimpse of the infallible nature of this spiritual world. How does it compare to our current existence? Similar? It's not even close. Not even close. Any other examples of infallible that you can think of? Imagine growing a garden and no need to pull weeds. Just fruits grow. Just no waiting for seasons. You plant the seed and immediately the crops come. How wonderful. So, never return. It is infallible. Were there some of the other characteristics? It is the supreme destination. What does supreme destination mean? The ultimate destination. Hmm? The ultimate destination. The ultimate destination. Which means that when you reach the ultimate destination, what happens? 
there's no more to go. Which means then? One is completely satisfied. One is completely satisfied. And what is the result when one is completely satisfied? Bliss and happiness. Right? When we achieve something in the material world, I achieve a million dollars. Am I happy? Maybe for some time. But am I happy for a long time? Why? Because there's more. There's still one more I can get. It is not the ultimate. But once one reaches the supreme, by which there, beyond that, there is nothing higher than one has no more unsatisfied desire. And thus, this destination yields this eternal peace and happiness. So where is the only place we can find eternal peace and happiness? In Krishna's supreme abode. He says, that is my supreme abode. So in the 22nd verse, we'll read that. If someone wants to read the verse. Now we'll see. How to reach, how to achieve Krishna's supreme abode. It is here clearly stated that the supreme destination from which there is no return is the abode of Krishna, the supreme person. The Brahma Samhita describes this supreme abode as Ananda Chinmaya Rasa, a place where everything is full of spiritual bliss. All the variegatedness manifests there is of the quality of spiritual bliss, nothing there is material. That variegatedness is expanded as the spiritual expansion of the Supreme Godhead Himself. For the manifestation there is totally of the spiritual energy as explained in chapter 7. As far as this material world is concerned, although the Lord is always in His supreme abode, He is nonetheless all-pervading by His material energy. So by His spiritual and material energies, He is present everywhere, both in material and in the spiritual universes. Yes, Yantaha Shastani means that everything is sustained within Him, within either His spiritual or material energy. The Lord is all pervading by these two energies. To enter Krishna's supreme abode or the innumerable Vaikuntha planets is possible only by bhakti, devotional service, as clearly indicated here by the word bhakti. No other process can help one attain the supreme abode. The Vedas also describe the supreme abode and the supreme personality of Godhead. Eko Vasi Sarva Ga Krishna. In that abode, there is only one Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose name is Krishna. He is the Supreme Merciful Deity, and although situated there as one, He has expanded Himself into millions and millions of plenary expansions. The Vedas compare the Lord to a tree standing still, yet bearing many varieties of fruits, flowers, and changing leaves. The plenary expansions of Lord who preside over the Vaikuntha planets are forearmed, and they are known by a variety of names, Purushottam, Trivikrama, Keshava, Madhava, Aniruddha, Rishikesha, Sankarshana, Pradyumna, Sridhara, Vasudeva, Damodara, Janardana, Narayana, Vamana, Padmanava, etc. The Brahma Samhita 5.37 also confirms that although the Lord is always in the Supreme Abode, Goloka Vrindavan, He is all-pervading, so that everything is going on nicely. Goloka Eva Nivasati Akhilatma Bhutaha As stated in the Vedas, Svetishvatara Upanishad 6.8 Parasya Shaktir Vividhyaiva Shuyate Sobhaviki 
Jnana Bala Kriya Cha. His energies are so expansive that they systematically conduct everything in the cosmic manifestation without a flaw, although the Supreme Lord is far, far away. So what is the only way in which one can achieve this great, supreme, infallible, eternal place from which no one returns back? What is the only way in which one can reach that? By the process of devotional service. We remember at the end of the sixth chapter, Krishna stated that of all the yogis, who is the highest of all? He said the bhakti yogi. Yogi nama api sarvesha madgate nantaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yo mam. One who faith is abiding in me. Same yukta tadomataha. That is the highest of all. The Bhakti Yogi is the highest of all. And in this middle section of Bhagavad Gita, chapters 7 through 12, Krishna is speaking about Bhakti. Pure devotional service. So, this is the only means to achieve this supreme destination. <coughs> At the end of this chapter, Krishna is going to the last two verses further glorify the potency of bhakti. But he establishes it here. And he said in the prior verse in 14, One who always remembers me without deviation, I am easy to obtain, O son of Prita, because of his constant engagement in devotional service. So, this devotional service is the only means to attain the supreme abode. And there are many important implications of this. So let us make sure that we understand what is the mood in which we should develop this desire, and we can say this intense desire, to attain the supreme. Because to the extent we have intense desire, to that extent we'll put forth sincere effort. Right? If I have a sincere intense desire to get a good grade in school, I will study very hard. If I have an intense desire to make a fit body, I will be very sincere in the gym. So if I have a very intense desire to attain the Supreme, then I can be very determined in my devotional service. So, now Krishna says, he qualifies the type of devotional service. What type of bhakti results in attaining the Supreme? Unalloyed. We have a jeweler with us. What is the meaning of alloy? You know? Alloy. Maybe he may not be going Yeah, to you know, you can. Alloy. Mixture of metal. Mixture of metal. You know in Canada, alloy? No. No. Don't no. metal mix it with some metal. Don't let it be. Mixture of it. Like tin is an alloy. Okay, now I understand. No problem. You so, mix gold and silver to make ornament, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. gold and copper. Yeah. So gold and copper is mixed. mixed. Okay. So what is unalloyed? No mix. No mix. Pure. Pure. So Krishna is saying pure bhakti, unalloyed devotion. So what kind of alloys or mixes or contaminations do we put into our bhakti? Personal motivations, like material desires. material desires. I'll chant one round of japa, so one more dollar in the bank account. <laughs> what, what other kind of motives or 
alloys do may might one put into their bhakti? If I do this, I'll get. If I chant more hours, I'll get this. Some material desires. Jnana and karma. Jnana and karma, right? What is the meaning of this jnana and karma? How does that <coughs> manifest in our bhakti sometimes? Yes, we become very confident in our jnana. And specifically this jnana speaks about this monistic philosophy. This impersonal philosophy. So, like in anything, when we contaminate something, we bring down its potency. And we dilute the effect. But unalloyed devotion means ultimately that one is constantly fixed in devotional service. Remember, to guarantee we are remembering Krishna at the time of death, it means we must be constantly meditating in the service of Krishna. Undeviated, is what he said in the 14th verse. And unalloyed means no mixture of other desires. So what is the only desire one should have in their bhakti? Please Krishna. To please Krishna. What is the only desire one should have in their bhakti? What is the only desire one should have in their bhakti? So what is the only reason we should want to go back to the eternal supreme abode? To please Krishna. To serve Krishna for his pleasure. So even the desire to go back to the spiritual world can become, can contaminate, can create some personal motives. Right? Oh, I want to go where I can get anything from a tree. A kalpa vriksha. I want to go where I can drive on the highway and no police officer will pull me over. I want to go where I can live in a huge palace and I never have to clean it. That's all exists in the spiritual world. But what is missing in that consciousness? Will a giant palace, which is infallible, perfect, will that give us happiness? What is the only thing that will give us happiness? Our relationship with Krishna. That is it. Because we are part and parcel of Krishna. The only thing that will give us peace and happiness and bliss is our relationship with Krishna. So as we aspire to reach this supreme destination, it should not be so that we may live in a luxurious palace by ourselves. No. So that we may be engaged in loving service of our Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. And because in the spiritual world it's infallible, it means when I'm engaged in serving Krishna, I will never get tired. My body will not require rest. Which means I can serve Krishna 24 hours a day. I'll never go to the storeroom and with a desire to prepare some wonderful offering for the Lord and find all oh, the vegetables are spoiled. Or this specific vegetable I want to prepare for Krishna is not there. Not what I want to eat. What Krishna? Oh, I want to make some wonderful jewels for the Lord. And thus I will go to the desired tree. The facilities of the spiritual world 
are meant for whose pleasure? Krishna's pleasure. So we must become very fixed in this consciousness that we are not going as a place for us to vacation, but going where we can have uninterrupted opportunity to serve Krishna. And what is the goal of our desire to go to the spiritual world? To please Krishna. And when one has such unalloyed devotion, meaning no other goal, not even one's own self-existence, protection, preservation. When one desires no happiness for oneself, but just to please Krishna, what happens? What is the result of such devotion? The ultimate bliss in our love experience. <laughs> More bliss and happiness than we can even calculate with our limited minds. It's completely counterintuitive, right? But this is the nature of bhakti. That when one approaches the Supreme Lord with pure love, simply to please Krishna, the Lord is so happy with such pure love, He showers back unlimited mercy and bliss. So, this unalloyed devotion, this mood of bhakti, we have to try to develop in the heart. And how we can develop it in the heart? We don't have to wait till the spiritual world. We begin to practice today. And that is why Rupa Goswami gave us this definition of pure devotional service. Anyabilashita shunyam gyanakamadi navatam anupuliyana krishna anushinyanam. Pure uttama. It's uttama, highest bhakti. It has these characteristics that we should study in great detail. And the nectar of devotion explains this process of unalloyed devotional service. How to practice pure devotional service. So, let's make sure that our goal is very fixed. What is the goal of our devotional service? And what is our goal in going back home to Godhead? And the beauty of serving Krishna in the spiritual world is we have unlimited facilities to serve Krishna, not to serve our senses. Unlimited facilities to serve Krishna. And thus, one follows this proper formula. Now Prabhupada, in the second to last purport, speaks about there's also variety in the spiritual world. What kind of variety is there even within the spiritual world? How, how many different planets are there? Hmm? Unlimited. And what are many of the, what are those numerous planets called? Vaikuntha Loka. But where does Krishna reside? Goloka. The spiritual world is compared like a lotus flower. And in the center, the world, the center of the lotus is Goloka Vrindavan. And surrounded by Goloka are innumerable Vaikuntha planets. Who is present in the Vaikuntha planets? Different planetary expansions. Different expansions of Krishna. In the form of? Vishnu. Narayan. And where is Krishna situated again? Actually, Krishna is only situated, yes, he is situated everywhere, which is the last paragraph, but in his form he is situated in Goloka Vrindavan. So based on the mood of our worship, 
there's also different destinations within the spiritual world. That Srila Prabhupada is illuminating for us. And the most intense loving relationship between the devotee and Krishna exists in Goloka Vrindavan. So, we can further define our desired destination. I want to go to Hawaii, but I want to go specifically to the island of Maui. To the particular, maybe, area. We get very precise. So, similarly, not only going to the spiritual world, but going to Goloka Vrindavan. Because that is where Lord Sri Krishna is eternally present. And one's relationship with Krishna in Goloka Vrindavan has the most intense rasa. Not to minimize the rasa that exists elsewhere, but to glorify the highest rasa of Krishna. And in the final purport chapter, Prabhupada is commenting, while Krishna is situated in the spiritual world, Though he is situated there, he is also simultaneously present everywhere. Which means, when can we have the direct association of Krishna? Now. Right now. How we can have the direct association of Krishna right now? Remembering, Remembering it. Remembering Krishna is non-different from being in Krishna. It is actually more intense. And who learned that lesson firsthand? From Lan Maharaj. But even more intense? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed. And whose mood is he showing? Gopis. They were in intense remembering of Krishna. More intense than when they were never physically together. So remembering Krishna, we can be in direct association. How else? Can we chant him? When we utter the word Krishna, Krishna is dancing on our tongue. Whether we see it or not, it is there. Whether I see the air around me or not, is it there? It's there. Whether I see it or not. When we chant Krishna, we are in direct association of Krishna. He is dancing on our tongue. So if we are calling out to Krishna, we must be attentive. We cannot call out to somebody and then not be attentive to them. If you call somebody to your house, you say, my dear friend, please come home. Come home on this day, this time. You beg. And then they come to your home on that day, at that time, and then you're busy doing something else. How will that friend feel? They'll feel nice? Welcome? When we are chanting the holy names of the Lord and we are inattentive, what are we doing? We are calling to Krishna, but our mind is going somewhere else. Our mind is somewhere else. So, we must try to focus the mind. We are calling to Krishna, let us think of Krishna as much as we can. That will increase the potency of our chanting. So this is unalloyed devotion. Is the only means to attain the supreme world, the supreme destination. And the purpose to attain the supreme destination again is? To please Krishna. And when our goal is only to please Krishna, don't worry. One will experience incalculable bliss and happiness. Never be left behind. So in the next four verses, Krishna is speaking about 
how the yogis have to leave their bodies at different times. If you leave in the day or you leave in the night. If you leave when the sun is in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. All these different rituals that we worry about. Oh, what if I leave at an inauspicious time? Right? We sometimes wonder. So Krishna gives us the assurance in the 27th verse. After speaking, you know, the mystics who pass away during the smoke, the night, the fortnight, or the waning moon, or the sixth night when the sun passes to the south, reaches the moon planet, but again comes back. According to Vedic opinion, there are two ways of passing from this world, one in light and one in darkness. When one passes in light, he does not come back. But when one passes in darkness, he returns. So what is our worry? When we may pass. Does the devotee have to worry? Krishna says in the 27th verse, Although the devotee knows these two paths, O Arjuna, they are never bewildered. Therefore, always be fixed in devotion. Krishna's devotee, doesn't matter when they pass. There is no inauspicious time. Why? Because they are eternally associating with Krishna. What inauspicious thing can come when you are associating with the Supreme Lord? Nothing. So next week we'll discuss the 28th verse in which Krishna is giving us the ultimate statement by which we can become fixed in bhakti. And what he says is one who performs devotional service is not bereft of any other practice of spirituality. What it means? When one does bhakti, all other rites and rituals and processes are included within bhakti. But there is one exclusive benefit that is awarded to the practice of bhakti, that is not awarded in any other practice. And what is that benefit? Attaining the Supreme Lord. Only bhakti will give us the key to unlock the door to the Supreme Lord. Only bhakti. So bhakti includes everything else, but on top of that, it has this added so that is what we'll discuss next week. Any questions or comments? Everybody has their beads.